Um, when you download the CSV with the um, homologs of hemerythrin, there should be, let me tell you. Um, well, last time we did this, we had 27, yes. This, of course, may change over time because if you have a new structure deposited in the PDB that is supposed to be homologous to your query, you will have a new more, more, more structures, well sequences that correspond to that structure. I think we can start um, again our session and the next uh, subject that we are going to cover is pairwise, pairwise structure comparison. And pairwise comparisons were mainly the reason why we thought about this workshop. So there are many methods to do structure comparisons, but usually we just stick to the one that is the best well known. Um, but I have found out that within all the methods, the most important thing is not the algorithm, but the alignment itself. And you can derive so much information from a well done structure superimposition. So here we have the comparison of two results of a superimposition of a very simple fold. These are beta barrels, but this superimposition is very hard on structure algorithms. So the number of solutions of these problems is huge. Um, and what happens is that some programs will handle some types of structures better than others. And you always have to compare your results. Um, between different programs. So I would, the, the thing that the take home message before we start with this block is always try to do your superimpositions with one, more than one method. And what's uh, macromolecular structure alignment? So when we do a structure alignment or superimposition, the goal is to obtain an optimal superimposition between two given protein structures where the match length is long and the root mean square deviation between the aligned residues is small. And really what we are performing are just rigid body transformation. So we are going to treat the protein structures, the coordinates as rigid bodies, and we are going to move usually one and the other will remain in its coordinates. So many algorithms find ways to do it differently, but what happens is mainly that there are allowed transformations like translation in the space and rotation. And that's all that is allowed in this uh, rigid body transformation. There are other mathematical things that could be done like reduction or amplification of the size, but because these are rigid bodies, the algorithms just don't do that. Then another thing that an algorithm can specify is how it's going to treat the uh, coordinates of our structure. So if you remember from the first talk, the protein structures are deposited in the PDB as coordinates in, in either two type of files. So we have XYZ coordinates, coordinates and 
usually we don't take each one of these atoms uh, to perform the superimposition, but instead we represent these molecules as the alpha carbon atoms. So one of the ways of representing is taking each one of these alpha carbon atoms as single points in space in three dimensions and then try to find out the solution for the superimposition such that the most, the most number of carbon alpha atoms are superimposed to a very short distance between the two structures. So if we take the, these atoms as isolated points in space, this is what's going to happen. An algorithm is going to try to align them. Once we have the uh, optimal solution, we will have uh, the representation of the two structures as being in the same set of, of in the same space overall. Um, the two algorithms that can do this are Dali Light and Click. Uh, each of each one of these has a different philosophy behind, but they are dealing with atoms isolated in a three-dimensional space. Another type of representation of our protein structure will be then at alpha carbon atoms, but connected one to each other, meaning that we are going to take into account the linearity of our molecules. And this makes sense because in nature, we know that the polypeptide chain uh, really has a directionality. So if we represent our alpha carbon atoms as connected dots in space, uh, we are going to do the same with an algorithm. Uh, it's just that the answer that this algorithm will give us may be a little bit different from previous methods. So the programs that use this approach are this uh, mammoth, mammoth CE and T TM align, align FATCAD, FAST and RAPIDO. And among these, uh, you can find the most used methods because the trade-off here is algorithms that take only alpha carbon atoms as isolated dots in space are going to take longer to run than algorithms that take the linearity of them. So these are still very sensitive algorithms, but are less slow than the others. Actually, they are very fast, usually. Of them, my favorite, but that's a personal choice, is TM Align. And then another way to representing this is just reducing this three-dimensional structure to its secondary structural elements. Um, so in this case, we would just represent the entire helix as a large uh, section and the same with strands. And what happens is that we are reducing still the information we are feeding our algorithm, but the goal is still the same. And these are going to be very fast algorithms, but of course they are more prone to find suboptimal solutions. Um, the algorithms that use this are listed in here. And from here, I would say the most famous ones are SSM and Gangsta. And finally, um, a newer field would be to represent these as graphs. And in here, still, we are reducing uh, the space we are going to be searching. And we are going to represent the graph of this fold. And then we are going to try to match these graphs together. And what, whatever is uh, different from these graphs, we are going to take it out and try to superimpose what is similar. These are very fast algorithms, the last ones, and they can be very accurate. Um, many of these algorithms are being developed um, right now. So this is an overall uh, view of how different algorithms handle the information we are feeding uh, to them. So first is about their representation. Another thing an algorithm has to take into account 
to give us the best solution is how uh, they are going to uh, do this. So there is a huge difference between algorithms that take uh, the elements as connected as versus those that take the elements as single bodies in the space. So it can be carbon alpha atoms, alpha carbon atoms or single secondary structural elements connected or disconnected in space. Most of the algorithms use a sequential approach, meaning that A um, is going to be always before B in the two structures that we are comparing. And these will have implications on the results we are going to have. So we have to keep in mind that in the three-dimensional structure, there are things that can happen to our molecule uh, that don't have to do with the sequence, linearity. Some of these are, for example, changes in the, in the fold conformation where you can find a strand or a helix swapping in three-dimensional space, but the sequence is going to be the same. So non-sequential algorithms are the ones that are going to handle this information better. So here I would, um, this is the point where I will show you the difference between these two types of algorithms using two paper clips as a proxy of protein structure. I have my paper clips here. Um, unfortunately, the, the way this uh, workshop in Zoom works is not allowing me to access my other camera so that I can show you the difference between the two of them. But I will try to make a video and I will try to show you how you can understand the difference between this algorithm using two paper clips. So I'm sorry about that. But in the end, what this demo is showing is that sequential algorithms will try to, the sequential topological algorithms are going to try to superimpose uh, the most elements that are in the same uh, directionality. So it doesn't make sense here because this is a 2D graph. And what I was going to show you is in 3D. So a difference in the fold will, will have um, a lot of significance in these algorithms. So a sequential topological algorithm will find these two elements very quickly because these are the longest. A sequential non-topological algorithm can find things in structure that are similar but that don't have any significance in biology. So we have to remember that in biology, sequence cells do have uh, directionality. So if you are superimposing in the um, two structures that are very similar, but they go in different uh, directions completely, so you're superimposing something that goes from amino termini to the carboxylo termini, and the other one is in the other direction, it will be a very interesting case it's just that in biology, they, this, make, this may not make sense. And then the last type of algorithm is the non-sequential, non-topological, but with a threshold. And this means that these algorithms are going to allow you to superimpose things in space that are similar. They are going to allow you to do some of these regions uh, with a different directionality, but not all of them. And once you have your superimposition, what you have to do is measure the difference between these two structures that you are superimposing. So for that, we use alignment scores. The simplest of them is the RMSD, or the root mean square deviation of the distance between the alpha carbon atoms in the superimposition. So in here, um, the alpha carbon atoms are represented as these blue and green, green dots. Um, so blue dots correspond to one protein and green dots would correspond to a different protein. And we are just uh, computing the distance between the aligned 
um, atoms. And then computing the root mean square deviation of these distances to have an idea of how separate they are in three dimensional structure. And then if the atoms are very close together, we will have a lower distance, so a smaller um, RMSD means more similar because the atoms are closer together. A larger RMSD means more different because the atoms are far away. So it is also true that in protein evolution, we often have a core of our proteins that is very well conserved. And then the regions that are on the outside of our protein are more variable. So knowing this, um, some of these algorithms are taking a different metric to put more weight on the parts that are similar and closer together and give a, a lesser weight to everything that is not so similar. So what I'm saying is RMSD is going to be too confounded by these regions that are external to the protein that may not be very similar, but other scores may take into account the fact that some parts of the protein structure are more conserved than others. So one of these scores is the TM score. And the TM score uh, takes the similarity, is a measure of the similarity between two proteins. And it is going to give you a value between zero and one. And in here, one indicates that your protein is absolutely the same in the two, in the two structures that you are comparing and a zero you will never get this, but it means that the superimposition was impossible. So the, it, it goes from zero to one, but usually you get something between 0.1 and one. Um, and this is taking into account two parameters, the length of the aligned region. So not the entire length of the protein, and then it's going to use the length of the target of, of the protein where you are superimposing. Um, so this, this will make your score not to be confounded so harshly on the on these residues that can't be easily aligned. Another way to accomplish this, uh, so take less weight on everything that is not so similar is the SP score. And in the SP score, there's a cutoff uh, of uh, four Armstrongs, but you can change it. So everything that is beyond four Armstrongs is not going to be taken as the main core structure. Um, so the logic behind this is somewhat similar to the TM score. It's just that in SP score, you get an artificially artificial defined uh, threshold of for Armstrong's. So it may be good to, to compare to structures using this TM score or SP score. Just be aware that the SP score has this threshold that it has been somewhat arbitrarily been defined. So it's going to take the distance of your proteins if only when they are below this threshold of four Armstrongs. So now that you understand a little bit the difference between the different scores, so RMSD, TM score, and SM score, we can go ahead and compute some of these structure superimpositions and, and to see the differences that of the results that we obtain. So let's go and so hi again everyone meanwhile you are answering the exercise exercises we will solve some of your doubts so the first is of amit jadav as, asked if um, a pdb file contains 3d coordinates of atoms present in the protein structure where is where is origin zero 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 place in the structure 
Mm -hmm. This is a very good question. So you, it's very rare. It's not usual to find the zero, zero, zero origin. It would be amazing if we said that. Uh, but the coordinates of the carbon alpha atoms or of any atom in a PDB file will be the will depend on the data retrieved from the structure determination technique. So the protein, the coordinates are a model that are compute that is computed from uh, derived data. In the case of crystallization, this derived data is the scattering plot. So once you resolve uh, using a Fourier transform, the meaning of this scattering plot, a program is going to transform this scatter of the X-ray into coordinates. And then the coordinates will and then the coordinates will be derived from that. And that's why you will not get a zero, zero, zero origin. You will have coordinates ev everywhere. So that's why doing the superimposition has to take into account that the transformation has to be from one protein that is going to be arbitrarily, so not entirely arbitrarily, but it's going to be in space and not necessarily in the origin and then you're going to transform the other coordinates file into the, uh, the one that you want to compare. So yeah, there is no real zero, zero origin in a PDB file. Great, thank you, Claudia. So there's another question about Silvia. Silvia Armenta Jaime asked, could it be possible to find homologous proteins with different structures? This is also a very good question. And so many of the programs that we are using, like HHPRED and other predictors that we will use in the next block, use the information from the sequence to predict structure because usually a homologue will fall into the same structure, but it's not always the case. There are cases of proteins that um, are closely related, but they have a different fold. There are even proteins that can switch from one fold into another, depending on the conditions. One thing to take into account is that in evolution, these sequences that can be easily transformed from one to the other are not going to be very favorable because uh, imagine you have a protein that works better with one structure and then if it's not too stable and can be transformed into another conformation then um, through evolution you are going to lose the ability to transform to the other so the sequence space of that fold we will drift away from this switch, but there exist, these are called protein switches, um, but they exist. Uh, of course, they exist, and this is also a, a field of study that is relatively new, so we don't know many cases, but it's probably because it is not a very developed uh, field of study, but it's, it's thought to be unusual in proteins. Okay, Luis Solano is asking, the second image generated in the TM line, what do these dots represent? Mm -hmm. 
yeah, you, you have the two molecules and the TM align. In the left, it's only the alpha carbon atoms of the polypeptide you are studying. And on the right, it's all the atoms in the, in the file you gave. So in the case where you have ligands, or as in this case, you have a lot of solvent modeled into your coordinates file, what you are going to see is these dots. These dots are solvent. Now, one thing to consider is that if you see solvent, it means that the scattering plot was so good that you could see the oxygen of the water in that position, uh, which is very unusual. You usually see that in something that is called structural waters. Um, but in this case, it may be something different, which is called over modeling, which means you are assigning a model for that atom when your data really isn't given you that position. But what you see are solvent molecules. You may also see um, two larger um, atoms, which correspond to iron, because these molecules that we have been using as example bind, can bind um, iron atoms. And between these two iron atoms, there is, of course, one oxygen bound. Um, that oxygen, you can be a little bit more certain that it's present in the uh, scattering plot of the crystallization. Okay, Silvia Armenta has another question. In the case of two proteins with same function but different size or amino acids number, what is the best way to do a structure superimposition? Yeah, this will depend on how, how different the size is. So if the difference is just, can be considered just an extension of the amino terminal or carboxylo terminal tail, then any, any of these structure superimposition algorithms should handle it correctly. If instead what you have is two proteins with a very large difference, something like around 60 or more residues, you could think this may be even an another domain that has been incorporated in one of your proteins or lost from one of your proteins. So if you have the, a, a large, very large difference, I think you can try both. TM align is a very good al algorithm. Click is also very good. Um, Click will give you a better answer. If it still is not giving you a very good superimposition and you know that these are homologous proteins and they should be similar in structure, I would go back to what we learned in the first part of this tutorial and I would go to one of these classification systems and I would isolate the domain, the unit that is shared between both of them. So if they have the same domain, I would isolate in both structures just the domain and perform the superimposition just on the domains. Um, we are not showing how to do this because for that you will need to uh, play with, with your PDB file. So it would be a little bit more of work, but you can do that, uh, superimpose just the domains that are similar. Okay. Thank you, Claudia. Also, Heidi has another question that is related to the one that Silvia Armenta proposed. But yeah, she was asking, can we make the structure superimposition between parts of proteins, not the whole two proteins? So that's the same, I think. And then 
Jose Marchand asks, does TMLine allow processing only to PDB files? You mean, I think that he means that if TMLine allows uh, multiple structural alignment, I think he's trying to say that. Yeah, maybe you, yeah. So there are two things. Okay, let's start with the previous question. Yeah, exactly. So if you want to superimpose just fragments of a protein, I would suggest to, and, and this is maybe not the way to do it, but um, you can edit your PDB file and just take the part that you are interested in superimposing. So just take the residues that correspond to that. For that, you need to make sure you include all the atoms that are part of each residue in the chain and that you are studying and, um, and that you don't break the linearity of your coordinates file, but you can just edit, superimpose the fragments, just edit them in text and then use a superimposition algorithm. Then the second question, if it's referring to PDB different chains, for example, a protein with many chains can be superimposed to another protein with many chains. Not many algorithms can handle that, but there's one that is called MECAN. Let me see if I listed. In, yes, MECAN is one of the algorithms that is listed on top of this uh, tutor, uh, tutorial page. If the idea is to compute a multiple structure superimposition, so this, the same structure, like a multiple sequence alignment, the same protein many times, there are other algorithms that can handle that type of search. And we are going to use one of those in a future, in the last part of the workshop. So I think 